I'm very pleased to introduce to you Kristen Person, um, who is a physicist here among us computer scientists. She got her PhD in theoretical physics at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and she now is an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley, with a joint appointment at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And she is director of the Materials Project, which is an open, Google-style um, repository of materials. And um, it has more than 23,000 users worldwide. So I'll turn the floor over to Kristen. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And as Liz indicated, this is not my normal audience. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a motivation of why you might be interested in the stuff that I do. Um, so. Materials, I think, is one of the most underappreciated parts of your everyday life. They're quite amazing, and they enable everything from your normal activities to real societal changes. Uh, there's a reason that we name our ages after materials, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Silicon Age. Um, I've collected just a few of the sort of more recent examples here. We, uh, today, we build our... Uh, airplanes and bridges out of carbon composites instead of steels and concrete because hopefully it will make them more corrosion resistant. They're lighter, so if you're an airplane, you can fly further. Um, they're also cheaper, hopefully, to make that way. Um, we wouldn't have the communication age that we completely take for granted, that our kids take for granted to be hooked up to everybody across the world if we didn't understand what defects due to light transmission and, and signal transmission in materials. Uh, one of my favorite examples on a slightly more flippant side is given on your um, right upper hand when DuPont was asked during the Second World War or just prior to it to come up with a very lightweight and durable material for the new parachutes. They, invited, they invented nylon and of course then also landed a commercial gold mine that they're still um, benefiting from. We also have, we also need solutions to imminent threats to our society, pollution being one of them. And we really need ways to, to incorporate um, sustainable, clean energy sources into our society and replace those that we've been currently using for the last hundred years. One of them being solar, of course, Many of you may have solar on your roof, or you know somebody who does. This is a materials problem. This device is only as good as the underlying active material that turns sunlight into an electronic current. So if we can come up with materials that do this twice as good, we'll have twi twice as much energy from our sun. And there are many different materials that go into these panels, not just the active material that does that conversion. There's all kinds of plastics and transparent conductors, which all have, how can I say this, issues. They all have things that could, they could do better. So there, is a whole, there are whole tribes of people working on this. If we had better materials, we could do this conversion better. Um, if we want to harness all these clean, sustainable energy resources, most of them are intermittent. The sun is intermittent, doesn't shine all the time. Um, wind is intermittent. Then we need to store the energy in order to make the grid very stable so we can get energy whenever we need it. In order to do that, we need to store the energy. We need better energy storage systems, both for the grid as well as for electrified transportation to, again, decrease the pollution in some of the larger cities in the world. Batteries is a real materials problem as well. The material is literally the device in the sense that if you can find an electrode material that stores twice as many lithiums as the lithium ion batteries that we all depend on for today in our laptops, I'm sure you're all using, uh, we could drive twice as far with our car. We could store twice as much energy and hopefully without any safety concerns. So these are just some of the examples. So hopefully now you feel like, wow, Okay, we really need better materials. Come on, what are you guys doing to, to help us out here? So inv inventing or realizing new materials is not an easy game. If you look at a traditional solution to this, it's called the Edison style for a good reason. When Edison was looking for, his, um, for a filament for his new invention, the light bulb, 
he, um, he was, first of all, he was convinced that the best material had to be in the carbon family. So he ordered from all over the world more than 3,000 materials, and he tested each and every one of them sequentially until he found the best carbon-based material out of a lot. Did he find the best one? No, he didn't, right? We all know that in those old um, style um, light bulbs, they use tungsten. So first of all, Edison was biased by his intuition. He was wrong. The best materials were not carbon-based. And secondly, he did not have infinite time to do this for the Edisonian trial and error approach. Um, the tungsten, I think, was invented by a Hungarian group about 10, 20 years later. So that's the Edisonian style. Um, how would we like to do this? Well, this is how Hollywood thinks we should do materials design, if I can get this to work. But the sound isn't working, but that's okay. I can talk through it. Um, when Tony Starks wants to invent a new material, he has Jarvis. Let's try Syrian. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Render the periodic table. It's so much cooler with the rock music in the background. Um, and of course, then he just picks out Syrian and Dysprosium because they're cool sounding yeah, elements. And he bounces it around. I think he sort of synthesizes the material. And then he puts it into a body and tests this for biocompatibility in just about Initial biological compatibility 10 seconds. I would love to be able to do this. Who do you think we're closer to, Edison or Tony Stark? Edison, unfortunately. Um, the sad truth is that it takes, on average, 18 years from the time that we invent a new material in the lab and in the lab, it works better than state of the art of the other materials that are out there until it is commercially successful, if it is commercially, commercially successful. And that's from it works in the lab. That's when we scientists who believe that, OK, now I'm done, right? We're partying. We're, we're publishing in nature and science. We're patenting. We're moving on to the next big challenge. That's when it works in the lab. It's not when we have the first great idea that we're going to go after the next photovoltaic material. So what's the problem here? Why does it take so long? And by the way, all IP rights are out the window, right? 15, 18 years, that's more than the most patent protection you can get. So Tom Eager, who was the president of MIT uh, in 1995, spent a fair amount of time looking at this problem, why it takes so long. And the problem seems to be largely information. A material is like a chain with links. And it's only as good as the weakest link in that chain. And when we make a new material in a lab and we test it, we don't test it for all those links. We test for a few, the ones that made the high impact journal, right? But it could be that it's hard to scale up, that it's not cost efficient for the 10% extra performance you're getting, or that it's just simply there, it, it contains elements that we only produce a fraction of the amount needed in, on, on Earth today. So there are many reasons that these materials could fail. If we had more information at our fingertips to choose our candidates wisely, then hopefully the industry wouldn't have to spend 18 t years trying to engineer around and fix all the issues with the material, all, fix all those weak links in the chain. So information, huh? We live in the information age. Shouldn't this be easy? If I ask my two teenage daughters to find me a, a good battery material, what would they do? Google it, right? They would go Google good battery material. They will get a few hits. They probably won't get anything particularly inf informative. Um, if we ask them maybe a few years from now, if they go to college and they go into technology, which in the, in the case of the younger one, I seriously doubt. But if they do, they might want to pose a question like this, slightly more informed. I want a certain voltage. I want good stability. I don't want it to go up in flames. And I want good lithium ion mobility because that's how these materials work. Google does not give a good answer to this question. And why is that? because the underlying information simply isn't known. This is one of those problems where we are actually, we don't have the data. 
to do the data mining. Of all the previous talks that you've seen, you've seen people are, they're, they're swimming in data, right? There's so much data out there, they hardly know what to do with it. In our case, we don't actually have the data. Even though we've had material science for hundreds, for thousands of years, there really isn't a lot of really good materials data out there. So to give you examples, there are about 50 to 70,000 known inorganic materials today in the world. It's not that many, right? Um, and inorganic materials, that's where we kind of have to go to find the next battery material, to find the next PV, to find a good thermoelectric and so on. Um, the elastic tensor, which is one of the most fundamental properties of materials, it tells you how the material responds when you subject it to stress in some way, tensile or compressive. We know that for about 200 materials in the open literature. There could be that there are companies out there that sit on a lot more data, but that's not publicly accessible. Superconductors. We know a little bit more about the superconducting temperature of materials because that used to be a really sexy problem to work on if you were a material scientist. You got a paper in Nature or Science if you found a material with a, a, a quite high superconducting temperature. But if you measure the elastic tensor, not so great a publication. It wasn't going to do your career to do that. So that's where you see the difference in those two data sets. Dielectric constant, really important for capacitors for high voltage transmissions. We know that for about three to 400 materials out of the 50 to 70,000 out there. We can't even begin to correlate structure and chemistry with the properties we want. We're below 1% in coverage of the known materials, not even of all the unknown out there that we could be making today. So our first problem is data. We don't have the data. This is us. We're staring into the fog and trying to sort of predict where is my best material somewhere out there. So this is where I come in. When I was a graduate student, I was set to work on something that was actually fairly new. We can put the atoms in a material in the computer and we can, have, we can solve the Schrodinger equation for this material. So we, from pure quantum mechanics, we can calculate the properties of a material and we can actually extract some of those really important engineering properties that we need in order to make the, dis the decision whether this material would be any good as a photovoltaic, as a high strength alloy, as a carbon composite, or as a thermoelectric. This is a new tool in a toolbox because the algorithms have gotten a lot better since Schrodinger invented this, uh, mass this, this theory, um, and the computers have gotten a lot better. So when I was a student, we could do one element in one year. Today, we can do a lot more than that. If I get all of one supercomputing center, if I, for example, got all of NERSC, which is my partner at LBNL, um, I could crunch through 20,000 structures, materials, in one day and get one property for them. That's a sizable part of the known world of materials. So if I got a week, I could actually start looking at hypothetical materials and try to put new ones out there and see if any of those are better than the ones we have. This is a tractable problem. So what is, you know, what, what, why, are we, why aren't we doing this? Well, first of all, because it is fairly new. And secondly, because quantum mechanics is not exactly a poster boy for high performance computing, but we'll get to that. Um, assuming we could do this, we could now move from the Edisonian approach, right? Well, we try one material at a time, it's all in the lab, it takes a lot of time, to an in silico pre-screening. We're not gonna get the best material falling out of that funnel, but we're gonna get a lot better candidates. You can see it as, let's screen out all the materials that have a really bad link in that chain and only give the, the ones that have a slightly higher success rate and still do better on the performance metric to the experimentalists. Uh, this started this sort of idea of doing massive computations to get materials information and to discover new materials from that and to data mine that data started somewhere in the early 2000s. And there are a couple of examples of where we can point to computations as actually designing and formulating completely new material or identifying old materials that nobody thought they'd be any good for a particular application and moving them then to synthesis and testing, and indeed they work as predicted. 
So this is a fairly new phenomena, um, but we're just starting. Um, somebody else got very excited about this, the idea of being able to accelerate materials innovation and therefore um, incentivizing and creating completely new manufacturing in the US. Um, started something called the Materials Genome Initiative and Renaissance of Amer American Manufacturing, which, and I, here I quote, to fund computational tools and software new methods to make the process of materials discovery faster um, and more predictable and less expensive. The Materials Project was funded within this cycle of the Materials Genome Initiative and we rest on three pillars. First of all, we have to produce the data, right? Because the data isn't there. We can't go and get it from some great database somewhere. So our first mandate is produce the data. The second thing that we wanted to do was disseminate the data freely to the public. So we're not the only ones sitting on this, because this has been the status quo of the materials field for a long time, that people sit on their proprietary data. And you either have to buy it, or you don't get access to it at all. So make it freely available so that more people can work on these problems. And the last part, we wanted to also showcase how you do design using, if you have access to this kind of data. I'm very fortunate to be surrounded at Lawrence Berkeley by high performance computing people and, and data science people. So they've taught me a lot along the way. As Liz was saying, I'm a physicist, so I wasn't exactly trained in this. Um, and they told me, well, Christine, that's great. You're going to produce data. But data is really only useful if it is accessible, characterized, contains uncertainty quantification, and if you can connect it robustly to other data items. I can tell you that that is very rarely true in material science when we produce any kind of data. We publish it in some paper. It's not even true that the supporting information is available online. It's definitely not available in some electronic form if you want to get, um, if you want to get your hands on it. So we try to do better. So we try to live by these, by these rules. So it is accessible. This is the Materials Project website. This is the portal if you log in and all you need is an email address and you don't have to be honest about what that email address is. We have plenty of Disney characters that are registered. Um, and if you then register and you get into it, this is what meets you. It's sort of a slightly more complicated version of Google because we want to enable those searches where you actually can input, I want this voltage. I want this kind of stability of my material. I want this kind of lithium ion mobility and I want it to be a lithium intercalation material. And then you get a list of hits that actually fulfill those criteria based on our quantum mechanical calculations. We also take the data and we slice it in different ways and we have algorithms operating upon the data so that you can, if you're interested in corrosion of materials, if you're interested in phase stability and competition between different phases, if you're interested in batteries, then you can go to these different apps and just basically browse the whole of our data set within that context. Uh, the website is literally the tip of the iceberg. In order to do this, we had to construct a lot of um, codes that work on top of the Schrodinger equation and, and the proprietary software that we actually use to solve um, the quantum mechanical formulation of the materials. Uh, these codes help us to produce the data, to analyze the data, and to disseminate the data through the website and the API. So the first part is how to produce the data. So you write a supercomputing grant, right, to your favorite friendly supercomputing center. The first one we got was from NERSC. Um, you're very happy. You have tens of, thousands, of millions of CPU hours. And you go, OK, this is it. We're going to go to town. And that's when you hit all the obstacles. Because like I said, um, quantum mechanics and our codes are not poster children for high performance computing. We typically throttle after 30 to 40 nodes. We can't parallelize more than that, and that's just physics. It has very little to do with how the programs are written. People are working on it. They've been working on it for 20 years, so it's not an easy problem. But it reads, needs a real reformulation reformula of the physics equations that underline, uh, underlie the, um, the algorithms. So we have to do small jobs. And they are also, unfortunately, fairly unpredictable how long they're going to take. They're not short. They can take anywhere from seconds to hours to weeks. 
and it's not entirely clear, although the number of electrons and the number of atoms that go into the simulation correlates with it, occasionally we have these funky materials that take forever to converge because they're just weird. Um, and, and then we have to restart our jobs, which creates this problem that we're actually not at all optimized. These are the good jobs for a supercomputing center. They're very highly parallelizable and they're short. We're actually the opposite. So we're natural enemies and we've had to work a lot with the people at the high performance computing centers with queue policies, with wall time limitations to make sure that we can actually run at all. Um, this is how we see ourselves in the supercomputing world. Um, we have all these small ant jobs that want to get in. And in the beginning, in some cases, we, we just even weren't allowed to because we weren't parallelizable enough. So the first thing we did was to um, clothe ourselves, to, to pack all these small little ant jobs into one larger job that looked like one of those tall big guys. Um, but we still have to work with memory issues, with queue policies, and all kinds of other things. So this is not something that you, when you get those 50 million CPU hours, you go to town right away. It actually takes, uh, if it's taken my team of two, three people uh, working with the center to, for almost a year to get to where we are today. Um, we have some of the issues are mentioned here. Um, but yes, this is essentially the problem. Um, this is our, some of our snapshot data usage at NERSC or um, running usage at NERSC. We have fairly good statistics. You can see how the materials project is running compared to other and average user at NERSC. And we're sort of, it's a fairly distributed resource. So we're getting about the same as other people. Uh, that being said that these spikes are obviously not particularly efficient for us. We would love to have a more long-term sort of utilization of the cluster, but that's just not possible when you're dealing with sh shared resources. We're also extremely grateful, of course, because th these are resources way beyond what a single research group can do. We don't have millions per year to spend on just computing, so this is something that the Department of Energy is providing for us and essentially for free, which isn't, which, without which we couldn't do what we're doing today. Um, but I also like to highlight again that there was a lot of work to get to the point where we can actually utilize this resource in the same way as other people whose codes are much better suited for this kind of computing. So like I said, we had a number of these software codes that enable us to, to do this. Um, the, the one that's called PyMagen is the analysis software. That's the one that turns the raw output from the Schrodinger equation into something that an engineer can understand. So you don't have to be an expert on the theory. Um, Custodian is the self-healing guy from Terminator. I'm totally dating myself by this. Um, that's the guy who fixes all the problems that happen to all codes when they run, and they self-heal with, with automatically without human intervention. And Fireworks is our workflow code that follows a submission all the way from the beginning of the structures, databases that we use to have information input from. We do all kinds of transformations, and Fireworks follows this entire process through to the bitter end um, and leaves no material behind um, in the sense that even failures are documented, well documented. Those are actually really important almost as important as the successes, because we learn from them. As you can see, my team is slightly on the nerdy side. Uh, Captain America is the benevolent dictator of fireworks, and the Hulk manages PyMetion. Um, so metadata, I promised metadata too, right? All of these software are open source. It took a bit of convincing uh, in my community for these graduate students and postdocs that spend years on developing a new code to tell them that they have to give it out for free. But once you get hundreds of developers around the world that are now helping them to maintain these codes, to submit new, uh, new algorithms and new modules to it, they're all firmly on board. Like I said, we have benevolent dictator a la the Linux model, and I'm extremely grateful to the committed people who spend their free time looking over commits from all over the world and testing them and making sure that they can be merged safely. A lot of documentation and a lot of testing. 
This is a, for everyone who's doing software development, it wasn't what I was planning to do with my career, but it is a continuous strife against entropy, right? Um, so when, so uncertainty quantification, it's not that easy for us. Remember I said that we only have so many data points. Material science is very data poor. So when we start with calculating a new property, for example, the elastic tensor of materials, we start out by writing a workflow for it, and then we benchmark it against all the known world of data out there. So if that's 200 materials, that's all we've got. And that's the uncertainty quantification. That's the first part. You make sure you can reproduce within some error margin of error that known data. And after that, here be dragons. You go to the outside world and you try to, so you produce data for materials that nobody has ever seen before, or data for known, known materials. And then, of course, um, if you're young and enthusiastic, you also go on Twitter and uh, get a lot of happy feedback that you gave data to the community that they've never seen before. So the elastic tensor is one example, an extremely fundamental property. We're currently at about a little bit more than 3,000 elastic tensors, and we've been computing for almost two years because our computing resources are not infinite. We would love to get all of NERSC or OLC of Titan or Mira, but we don't because they're all these combustion people and climate simulation people that are using it all the time. Um, but we are 10x the experiment so far. So within just two years, we got 10x the amount of data that was out there. So we're getting there. And we actually are to the point where we can start to data mine correlations between structure and chemistry. The same thing with piezoelectric tensors. These are materials that are used in sensors, for example. Um, they give a little bit of a voltage if you compress them, or vice versa. Uh, some of the examples are speakers, telephones, um, monitors. 50 materials were all we could find in, in the literature that had a measured piezoelectric tensor associated with it. And we've so, so far, we've calculated more than 1,000. So again, we're sort of really accelerating the amount of data that's out there and that's available to the public. Uh, we have actually found, you might think that, well, sensor is not a great example of fixing the pollution in the world or something like that, but the best piezoelectric material contains lead. So that's a, a hazardous processing and it's not great, you have to recycle them. Um, so coming up with a lead-free piezoelectric material that is better than state of the art is actually quite a big deal. We have, and hopefully some of them are under testing uh, at another friendly national lab, and we'll see if we can get to a better material. I'll highlight that not all properties are created equal. We can calculate structures and chemistries fairly rapidly, but tensors like the elastic tensors and piezoelectric tensors take a long time to compute. So for every of those properties that we add to our database, we need more computing and more time to spend on benchmarking. And we have less and less data to benchmark it with. Um, I promised some design as well. So this is one of the materials classes that we wanted to make an impact. There are amazing materials out there called thermoelectric materials. Actually, most materials are thermoelectric in one way or the other. They're just not very good at it. If you feed them heat, they will produce electricity. But some of them are really good at this. And can you imagine harvesting all the waste heat that we put out there in the world and turning that into useful electricity? Well, most of it within the laws of physics. Um, the reason we're not doing this is because waste heat is free. So it can't be an expensive material. It can't be a material you have to replace every two years. It has to be a fairly inexpensive, cheap, robust material that can do this day in and day out. And by the way, cycle through tremendous temperature differentials when your exhaust in your car is on, for example, and when it goes off. So 600 degrees Celsius due to room temperature all the time. So this is a tough, tough sell, but it would be amazing if we could do it, right? So one of the things we've concentrated on is trying again to in silico design novel bulk materials that can do this efficiently. And here's one family of them. Some of them have been now synthesized and tested, and indeed they work. They don't work as well as we would want them to. They're not, you can't dope them well enough, but that's an optimization problem, hopefully. Another thing that we're working on is sunlight to fuel. 
It would be nice, right, if we can just take the sun's rays and split water into oxygen and hydrogen and use the hydrogen as a feedstock for fuels. So at least we have a sustainable way of getting fuels. Um, there are materials that can do this. Again, this is an amazing catalytic ability of some materials to be able to excite electrons and split molecules into components where you'd want them to be. But it's also a very hard materials problem to work on because they tend to, they don't last very long, they're not very efficient. So there are all kinds of things we have to work on to make these materials better. But that's the vision for the future. Maybe we can do this and just turning sunlight into fuel. So that's what we've been doing in the materials project. We've been producing the data at least more than what's out there. It's freely available. We've been disseminating it to the public and we've been showcasing that you can use this kind of data to design novel materials. But it, does this do anything for the rest of the world? Most of you probably never heard of the materials project, right? Because it's not something that you work on. Um, I was young before the internet revolution, so I actually don't doubt that if you give free data to people, they do amazing stuff with it. I see it every day. And I remember how it felt when you can suddenly get access to things you, you had to work really hard at before. So I don't doubt that if you build it, they will come. Uh, if you give materials data freely to a community, you will see people cropping up with good ideas. Um, one of the examples is the accessibility. We have, of course, an API where you can download the entire database, all of it, freely. And last year alone, I think it serviced 38 million requests. Um, we have a fairly rapidly increasing user base, somewhere a little bit more than 25,000 currently. Of course, if you're Facebook and Twitter, this is nothing. This is a drop in the ocean. But considering that the materials project or the materials science community is a lot smaller than the general public, it's not so bad. And we have only been online for a couple of years. Um, we serve about three to 400 sessions per day. And a lot of our users keep coming back, which is great because that means they actually have some, they believe that there's some worthwhile there. Um, this is a snapshot of the usage, global usage last month. And you can see that obviously a lot of people in the North America have realized how useful this is. Uh, Europe, Asia, of course. But it's also really nice to see that in the developing world there are people realizing this. This is one of, their, one of the few, I would say, the only one, the amount of data that we have that is freely available. It doesn't cost money. So if you have a really bright idea or you want to get access to this kind of data and you're in Nigeria, this may be your only resource for free materials data. And I'd like to keep it that way, hopefully. Um, when you give this kind of um, resource to people, some of them get very excited and they give you the feedback, I'd love to give something back. I also produce materials data, but I have nowhere to put it. So they're asking us if there's some way that they can feed back into this. We built the machinery largely for disseminating our own data, but we're now getting inspired by all the requests we get from people who want to be part of this, who want to grow this to larger than, than what we are. Um, so one of the things we've been doing just last year is that we're allowing crowdsourcing. We're allowing people to upload structures and compounds, and we will run them for them, and we'll make them available freely on, on the project with their own provenance and whatever metadata they think should be on there. Uh, we've, in this way, we've gotten more than 1,000 new materials from the community. Um, we also allow people to vote on properties because, again, we are limited by the amount of computing we can utilize and get. So we can't compute everything. So we're asking people to bump up those compounds and those properties they're interested in, and we'll accelerate those in the queue. Uh, in terms of ontology, I said that it's important to connect to other data items. This last year, we got DUIs for every single one of our 66,000 computed materials. So you can now connect this to any other database that you might want to do it to. Um, this is the way to, we actually think we're Austis star data client. I think they've never served more DUIs on this in a single shot, 66,000. Um, I'm just going to end with the idea that users can design now materials. They can get inspired by what's out there. They can say, well, if I really like this thermoelectric material, but I wish it didn't contain tellurium, 
So I'm going to substitute that and with something else and run that compound and see how that one does. So that we are on our way towards something like the materials genome, where we can completely chart out all the properties and all the structures and chemistry and see how they correlate. So we can come up with new materials faster, more efficiently, and hopefully solve those of our societal problems that we need to solve. So I, I failed to say at the start of the talk that if you would like to post a question, you can go to Kristen's talk in the online program, and there's a, a link there called Ask a Question, and if you click on it, you'll be able to type in a question and vote on other people's questions. We also have microphones up in that aisle and that aisle there, where the light's just shown, um, and so uh, we're happy to, to take some questions. and. Um, until people get up there, I can just uh, let you know what, what questions were asked. So uh, there is a, a question here. What role do you think the National Institute of Standards and Technology, that we call NIST, uh, should play in disseminating this materials data? Should their standard reference materials be in your project? So that's a very good question. I, I believe NIST is actually funded, just like our project, through the Materials Genome Initiative to do exactly that. Um, I have always been hoping that they would sort of lead the effort on experimental data, which obviously isn't my, um, my expertise. It's hard to, to, to come up with standards. Um, I think the, um, the leadership of the Materials Genome Initiative at NIST, Jim Warren, has sort of taken the approach that rather than to do standards, I'm just going to harness data and the standards are going to have to fall out of that. So it's sort of slightly more of a sort of modern approach to the problem rather than creating the exact standards. Materials, unfortunately, have, have a different standard depending on the length scale. It, it, it changes if you, if you go out, the, the, the arrangement of the atoms are important, but also grain boundaries, the you know, larger assemblies of materials can completely change the properties of materials. So it's not just, not just one set of atoms that does it. And that's what the experimentalists are, are very challenged by. So I do hope they will do this. I think they are on their way, um, and we'll be happy to work with them. Very good. Okay, we, we have a question here. Let's see. Hi, can you, okay. So I just want to say this is awesome. I got my start doing these kind of quantum mechanical calculations, and now I'm actually working in HPC. Um, I was wondering if you've looked at the Jetstream resource with Exceed. It's a sort of a cloudy computing resource, and there's, I think that would be kind of perfect for these kind of calculations. You can have your, your small jobs that run for weeks at a time. That's great. Yeah, no, we're actually, are, we are running on Exceed on a fairly small allocation compared to, to the other ones, but um, they've been extremely helpful. That is true. Uh, Exceed is one of those that we have been utilizing. So, so thank you so much, though. Check out the I will. Yes, yes, I will. Thank you. Another posted question is, uh, do you know of aligned high throughput uh, experimental methods that would allow comparing calculations to lab measurements? You repeat that first part again, uh, aligned. Uh, do you know of aligned high throughput experimental methods oh. that would allow comparing calculations to lab measurements? Um, so I, there are a couple, so that's a very good and uh, insightful question. There are a couple of high throughput experimental equipments out there in the US. Uh, I actually work with one of them for photocatalytic material, the sunlight to fuel application. It's a very expensive setup, um, and the, the, the odd, there's no automatic comparison. It's basically we, we get all our data, they get their data, we sit in a room for hours and compare. That's how it's currently done. <laughs> Uh, we hope some of that data is hopefully going to be funneled into a slightly more efficient way of, of comparing it, but that is currently the state of the art. Well, a question that I wonder about a lot is I, I suppose this is a collaborative effort between physicists, materials scientists, high performance computing types. Um, do, are there communication issues between those different communities? <laughs> yes. 
everything is lost in translation. It takes years to, to get to the sort of understanding that I have with my team now at LBNL. And every time we go out to a new resource, we're currently working with ALCF and OLCF to get our codes to run there efficiently. And it takes a lot of explaining and working with, and, and, and you know, that's, that's just part of the job. It's, uh, it makes it exciting too, because it's new ground, right? But no, it's not easy. Yeah, There's huh? no, no simple way of doing this. <laughs> Good. Okay, any other questions from the audience? Well, let's thank Kristen for a really excellent talk.